All right, so I'm um, going to show you a couple of different things. The first thing that I'm going to actually show you is how we can implement some of this stuff inside FMOD Studio. Uh, FMOD Studio is now the new released product from the FMOD guys who made another engine previously based around a product called designer called the FMOD EX engine. Uh, this is called the FMOD Studio engine. Uh, big difference between the two is that FMOD Studio is sample-based audio and not frame-based audio. So there were issues in the older version of FMOD Designer in which triggering could be considerably different because frame rates could possibly dip inside the game and as a result your sound would not be synchronized correctly. Um, theoretically this problem is highly mitigated if not possibly entirely eliminated. Um, anyway, so another really really useful thing about this program is that when you create a file, which you can very easily do um, by going here. Usually when you go into FMOD Studio, if I just go straight into FMOD Studio directly, it'll always come up with a blank file. And when you save a new file, so like for example, if I say I want to make a new project, new project, and then I want to say save this project, and I'll just call it new project for now. So I save it as new project and I stick it on the desktop. Now when I do so, you'll notice one specific difference if you've ever worked with FMOD Designer before, is that FMOD Studio creates a folder for you called new project. And inside the project is the project file plus all of the folders associated with the project. If you were to save this as a new project, it will save another folder with the same exact file uh, characteristics and everything like that. And the reason for this is that because FMOD Designer was really, is, really, we just discovered it today, in fact, really finicky with being able to move a project from one form of media to another form of media. So uh, this is really nice in the sense that all of this stuff is all together, um, which is really, really, I think, a benefit from, uh, from the older version of doing things. So let's just take a look at our new project. All right, so there's different parts to the editor, and it's, it's quite complex. It's, got, it's very simple to look at, but it's got a lot of depth to it. Um, one thing to understand, quite, quite similar to FMOD Designer, is that uh, right-clicking is how you do stuff. Um, the event is the main sort of driving force inside FMOD in general. So basically, you create an event by right-clicking, and then you have a new event, and you're automatically going to get one audio track and a master track. Now, the thing that is really unique to FMOD Studio that is totally not unique to Designer uh, is the new window here called the Mixer window. You can theoretically send all of your events individually and balance the individual volume of every event against itself. Plus, you can route other tracks within an event to the mixer independently in order to get control over them. So lots and lots and lots of flexibility here. I can't demonstrate that. It's too you know, involved. Um, but that's really one of the big, big selling points of, uh, of, of, of FMOD Studio. It's, it's, it's really, really useful for that situation. So if we kind of back up and, and talk to people who have not really had much exposure to middleware applications, and we just think about this as if it was a you know, a DAW, right? We just hit the playback knob, which is a space bar, and we watch the playback knob go like this would happen really normally, right? So, but what we are talking about is adaptive audio, and adaptive audio uses parameters in order to be able to function. Now, obviously, I can just do this. I can, uh, I can take some, some stuff that's over here in my, um, in my things over here, let's say. And I've got a bunch of footsteps, so I'll take all my footsteps and I will drag them over into what I have called, oh, I'm sorry, in my F mod, I call my audio bin, which is a nice convenient name because that's the same thing they call it in Logic. Um, so I can take all my sounds and drop them right in here. I don't have to go file open or anything like that. I can just drop them in, which is really convenient. And I can preview them in here if I want to hear each of the individual ones. These are all been cut off and at another particular occasion. So here's a metal step. All these different steps here. So, um, so basically what happens is now I have all of these different sounds. Now, of course, I could sit there and put them all like on the timeline, like what Steve was doing with his. 
you know, like so, which is really painstaking and everything. Um, and move them like so. And then we get pretty much like what we'd expect from a typical DAW. Sorry, hang on one second. So, you know, if I pull this back to the beginning, we play it. There we go. No problem. So, but obviously middleware is used to dealing with things as assets, as things, and you can manipulate assets rather than specifically thinking about them as files. So, for example, what happens is uh, we can do a situation in which we have an event uh, that we can create inside an event called um, or a, a sound module, I should say, and this is a multi-sound module. So if we have this multi-sound module, we can take all of our sounds that we had here in our footsteps, drag them over here to this area, and now they will play inside this area. Now what happens is I can also then turn on a loop if I want to turn on a loop, and say add a loop region. And then this is again, like a typical DAW, right? But in this case, what's happening is every time I hit this region, it's going to trigger a new sound to happen. Over here, you can see this little yellow icon. Uh, that is a die, right? And so that means it's randomly picking between these different sounds. So basically, now it's going to randomly select between a sound each time. And if I want to make the tempo go faster, of course, I guess I can just sort of do this. Right, because it's just triggering one each time. Or faster still. Okay. Can we get this on for a second? No, so just to put this in context, so from what we were talking about before, if you were to give this to a programmer, right, or an integrator who had to deal with this, and you said, okay, for each of my footsteps, I've got eight different sounds, and then that's for water, and, and then he had to program this, or they had to program this, yeah. right? That would be it takes quite a, a task. Bit, it it, it they, takes a little bit of programming ability. They might look at you like this, right? Don't, or it's going to take some time, and they might not even have the time to do it, right? So now you're able to do this all by yourself, right, as a designer. So, um, so this is one way to be able to demonstrate that what we're talking about here. But another way that we can think about this, again, as adaptive audio, in other words, as a, as a parameter with inside the game, we can be thinking about a parameter called, we're going to call it um, surfaces, right? Uh, surfaces, whatever. <laughs> anyway, I'll just call it surface. So what that means is that this is basically like a programming hook, right? So it's a variable that might that say, okay, if surface is equal to uh, stone, then go with this sound set. If surface is equal to um, if surface is equal to metal, then we go to another thing. So he, when I do this and I add a multi sound, and I can take those same stone objects and put them like this. But my favorite thing to do to people who've never ever dealt with FMOD before is to basically hit the playback knob. Notice what's happening. Nothing. This isn't moving. Time has basically been suspended. The reason why? This is not time. This is one of those things where I have to tell somebody this. But, but, but the thing is that basically what this is, is this is a value. This is a parameter value. This could be 0 to 100. It could be 1 to 1,000. It can, in this case, be 0.0, 0, .0 all the way to 1.0 whatever you want as your parameter value. And then what happens is that inside the game, you can go from any value to any other value at any time in the game. So the game can send commands to be able to say, oh, I'm here at between, uh, what is it, 0 and 0 0.1, and now I'm going to be on stone. So now what I can do is I can make another multi-sound, and in this one, uh, I'll put the audio band back on, I can take this and I can make it into metal. So I can take metal steps and drag that into here. So now I have two surfaces. So that if I'm in value range 0 to 0 0.1, I'm in stone. And if I'm in value range 1 to 2.2 or whatever like that, maybe I'll, I'll move this a little bit better. So like 
point two to point three, right? Now it's metal, right? Except that if we didn't loop it, we're not playing it looped here, so we should do looping. Sorry, looping. Okay, this worked before. Oh yeah, come on. Oh yeah, because I have to I have to encounter it. That's right. It has to actually hit it, like enter the region. So if I do it this way, and go. Okay. So that's the metal. That's the 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 other steps. If I go over here, now I'm in metal. And back here, I'm in stone. So I can go back and forth. Time can go backward, literally. You said it had to encounter. The it has to actually, like, in this case, it had to actually encounter the region. Like, actually, yeah. So I couldn't, like, just drop it, I don't think. Oh, well, okay. No. Well, okay. It also it could also be that this is, like, slightly uh, not quite ready for prime time, even though it's the first release. <laughs> so that would have to be a marker that you assign it to. The Correct. Yeah. So you have a parameter, and you just say, now this surface is equal to 0.2. And then you go like this. And now you're in metal. Okay, so, oh yeah, I can do the publish, yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, publishing is done by means of banks, essentially. Uh, and so what happens in this case, uh, what's really nice is that you don't have to create banks anymore. You have an automatic master bank. You could create more than one bank if you needed to. And the reason for this would be some files might need to be compressed, and other ones not compressed, or compressed in a different way, perhaps. So each bank is going to basically be each type of audio file. Now, what a bank actually is, is one file, basically. It's one big file that the game can then access parts of that, you know, at various locations in order to trigger the various sounds that are in that bank. Okay, so rather than getting a bunch of individual sound files, you actually get one big conglomerate sound file. Uh, and then it just plays regions of that sound file effectively, as if they were separate files. Um, all right, so anyway, what happens in this particular case is you can take your bank and you can build it for a couple of different kinds of situations. The target platform is at this point our desktop, PC, Mac, Xbox 360, and PlayStation. So those are the three. You can't do iOS or Android yet. I'm sure they will definitely come up with versions to be able to do that. Huh? <laughs> no Wii, but I'm sure that'll also be following. Yeah, and the Wii U, of course. Can't forget that one. Um, in order to build, it's pretty easy. You go to the file menu and you choose build, and it's going to automatically just create a folder right underneath your new project uh, here that's called the build folder. And you look in the build folder, it says desktop, and it says master bank bank, nine kilobytes, master bank strings, 806 bytes. Now what happens in this particular case is right now, I didn't actually assign anything, that's why it's nine kilobytes. So you, have to, you do have to assign your sounds to the bank. The way you can do that, or rather your event, I should say, to your bank. So to right click, you can then say assign to bank, master bank. And then every sound that's in here that's associated with this particular event goes to that bank. So then if I go back here to build, you'll see that the build is now changed in size. So now it's 1.3 megs. Okay? So it's got all the different sound effects. So, um, yeah, I could do, I can maybe do that. I'll, I will talk a little bit, just a little bit about uh, what areas there are here. This is the event browser area, and this is the event editor area. And below here, when we edit things and I drop stuff and I configure things, didn't really do the random uh, pitch, but I could show that. Um, but anyway, uh, and then of course there's the mixer window, and we also had like the audio bin. So th those are the basic areas essentially, and they do change depending on. But luckily, the nice thing is that it keeps it to a relatively, relative minimum of amount of windows to have to deal with when you're dealing with the uh, FMOD Studio. But uh, yeah, I can take some questions if you want. Hi. Yeah. So when we're talking about the um, surface, what was that called again? Parameter. Parameter. Mm -hmm. um, something that bothered me was. Sometimes it was it's random, but sometimes it's playing the same sound file twice in a row. That's is, good. Is there some sort of um, 
flexibility to add some sort of language to like change, tweak little things like that? Yeah, or? actually being able to tra ch change uh, the randomization so that it does not pick the exact, uh, the exact same one all the time can be done by, um, I'm not sure if actually this, this can do it here, but there, there, there are ways definitely actually inside FMOD Studio to specify not repeating the random value. Okay, so yeah. that, that's like, uh, that's contained in the GUI, or you have to like? It's, a, it's in the GUI, and it's a it's parameter the called spawn time. Okay. So you can go through and you can choose how frequently a sound will trigger, and you can define it so you can say between one second and 15 seconds. For example, I don't know right? if that's the and question. It's so, like exclusive so randomness, like yeah, as opposed to yeah. repeating the same thing. Right, right, right. Yeah, and you can also have a probability as to whether the event will even fire at all. You know, so you can create a you can create a percent you have a percentage probability. This is very standard with a designer, uh, where basically you can randomize the amount of probability of how often, you know, this is going to fluctuate. In probability, whether the sound, in other words, whether when you receive a value here, whether that sound will actually happen at all, even. So, uh, two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is um, right now you have two discrete sort of bins of sounds on a parameter. Can you cross fade between those so that if the value was Completely. between that, you'd get a 50 50 split or you got some it. sort of fuzzy logic? Yep. Right. Just like that. Right, and the second question then is, uh, these are looping sounds and the parameter changes. Is there a way to ensure that uh, it doesn't cut in the middle of one loop and just jump to the other one, which might be kind of weird? Yeah, it won't actually do that in, in most cases. It'll okay. just, like in this case, it'll just simply crossfade the volumes between the two. It won't automatically stop stop the events or anything okay, like that. Okay, because I was thinking like mood music or something, you would want to... Correct. You might want to wait till the end of a, a bar or something. Oh yeah, that that's... Yeah. That's a, that's a little bit more of a thing, um, but yes, there is actually a way to do this now. And like, for example, in this case, you can actually quantize something to happen by a particular musical interval. If you can set a tempo, actually here, if you uh, right click on the timeline, you can actually create a tempo marker. And then at that point, you know, when the change happens, it can be, it can be within that tempo or not. Great. The thing about this is that actually this isn't tempo related. So you, you, you would be mm -hmm. talking to your programmer about how often are you hitting that parameter and you keep that parameter hooked up to some kind of tempo situation at that point. Right. So I just want to keep us on track here, and, and, and then we'll do another set of questions. So this is a picture of FMOD uh, Studio. So now we're going to go back. You are asking a musical question. So again, these are the footsteps from our level. You saw them go from the folders I was editing. That's the workflow. You didn't see me do it, but right, that's the workflow. Into FMOD, that's where those footsteps get, get, get worked. And now, in terms of Brennan's musical score, we're going to look at the FMOD designer session. So we're going to go back to designer and show you guys how you can create music, musically related, put those, put those intensity levels and put that interactivity together. Right. So in this case, uh, what we have is a parameter that I'm just simply calling param00. That's what it actually is default called. And, uh, it already has a range of 0.0, .0 to 1.0. And we've created uh, four, five different stopping points total. Uh, you know, uh, and you know, if we first start playing here, it's going to be playing the music for the ambience level. And then, depending on the conditions that are inside the game, we can get to the next level, which is the drums. Another level. And then the final level of intensity. So theoretically, but you know, then at some point, the character could, you know, go away. Things could come back down, potentially, you know, if you hadn't encountered any enemies for a while or whatever. Per this score. Yeah, the parameter value is the level of intensity per, per this score, exactly. And it's just a hook at this point in time. So, you know, we're just basically working it out. Um, 
and, and again, what you do with the parameter is dependent on the game situation, effectively. So um, in this case, you know, we're able to showcase Brendan's music. Um, and you know, this is what he decided the level needed to be and the intensity needed to be. Um, and then you'll see it in operation. In the next hour, you'll see it in operation in Unity 3D. Yeah. OK. Any, any other questions having to do with uh, designer? And so we've got some questions over here, yeah. Yeah. So I know how, uh, since I worked on it, how we did implemented <laughs> this. But um, as far as using FMOD Studio, and it gives you these banks. Now, yep. I'm, I'm not a programmer. So what good do those banks do me? How do I give them to a programmer? And what do they do with the banks to put them into okay, the game? So the bank, uh, the programmer basically takes the bank along with uh, the API. There'll be like a like an API that is meant for a particular kind of platform, and they combine the two together in order to be able, to, and I think there's probably something else. It may, in fact, involve the studio file, but in designer it involved something else. Let me just see if there's a special file. There's a GUID file, but I don't know if that's the same thing. Strings, yeah. So, you know, if you were to look at this with a text editor, most likely it gives all of the events names that are in there and then basically the API can figure out where those names are and then call the appropriate actions based on the names that are defined in the strings file right. and then the bank is the actual sounds. And your nomenclature becomes very important as you're delivering this so you're getting not only the hooks from the programmer right but you're also delivering different folders to them with media in them. Now the the wonderful thing about it is that if you have all your stuff in the game and you just want to change a couple of sounds you don't have to re-export your entire project. You can then just re-export those folders, right? Maybe, maybe, the, maybe they were too big, you need to use a different compression, right? And then that's all you have to deliver, right? So it, it's, it, games are an iterative process, right? Sound for games, absolutely an iterative process. So this, this puts that, also that control of the iteration in your hands as well, right? Um, so yeah, that's why the, it's broke the, the, the no, to break them down into banks and individual uh, folders of sounds. So with within that, um, is the are there like specific instructions for the programmer, or does it already give you yep. the code? It's in the API, yeah. although right now it's very very you know it's mainly just a lot of example files. There's not a lot of documentation at all currently. Yeah. That I've seen. Yeah. Other questions? We'll pass the mic around. All right, so th there is there is this sort of strings file that was associated with it, and you were saying that it was the you know the job of the audio dog to create an assets list. Right. Now, could you use that to create the assets list? Will FMOD present? Well, no, well, no, 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 not 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 so much. No, I no. mean, uh, the strings might have the individual uh, sound files, but what ends up happening is is that it, it's the generation of the bank that's the issue because basically the engine itself knows that when there's a bank and there's an ID that's associated with a the bank, then they know that that. Here, let me let me show it you. It renders it. It renders it mood, right? So, for example, the, the if I go into the new project, and well, let's just take a look at our audio assets. Every single one of our audio assets has now gotten a string associated with it. This incredibly, this is what they call a GUID. So, this is an absolute hard-coded identity for this particular sound file. That's probably in that strings file, most likely. That says. This here is going to be located to this section to this section within this bank. So when you play this sound, it actually means go from this location to this location inside this bank. Right. So it's a, it's a lot of very specific kind of information, but it, it, you know, an actual ASCII file name of your file is, you know, most likely the game knows it as this. Yeah. And, and it doesn't know it as boots underscore stone. Right. It knows it as that. And, and what's important about that is that, you know, in terms of working in FMOD, um, you'll figure that out fairly easily in terms of what it can do audio-wise and have fun with it. The actual nomenclature, actually getting your workflow together so that it locks in with your game and your programmers are happy with those deliveries, that takes some time. You really have to have structure. <laughs> you know, yeah. It doesn't take away, it's not willy-nilly, right? I mean, if, if, if anything will turn you into a bean counter, doing sound for games will turn you into a bean counter. Whether you're creating those asset lists yourself or whether FMOD's doing it for you, you still have to be organized, right? Um, there's just no, you know. I'll give an example. No way around it. Telltale Games, Walking Dead, okay? So there's a situation in which um, my friend Jory was working on the dialogue. He's done all the dialogue for that game. Um, 
dialogue recording. And uh, basically there was some situation in which they needed the sounds as immediately as, as, as possible. And what happened is that he had actually edited the sounds and they started using the sounds before he edited them. <laughs> And then everything was completely wrong, and they were like yelling at him and everything like that, that it had to be you know, done immediately and all that sort of stuff. And so he figured out how to automate like the right, you know, the mastering and everything like that based on his file naming convention, which he have, if he had not had, he would have had to do every single file by hand. <laughs> That's 2,700 files yeah. in 16 hours. That's what he did it in as a result of being able to uh, speed, you know, workflow is a huge portion of dealing with game audio. Yeah. Having to uh, adopt your, you know, uh, adopt a particular workflow that's going to work because you never know when you're going to be suddenly having to like come up with 800 sounds in two weeks. Yeah. When, when I teach my class, um, there's, there's, I always tell my students there's the same answer to everything. Right. And when you start to deal with games, that's file size. Right. I'll say any question that I'm going to ask you 80 percent of the time, if you're asleep and you lift your head up and go file size, you'll be right. <laughs> and in this case, workflow is the next answer. Right. So that's that's really what we're trying to expose is those those important those important elements of workflow. Yeah. Uh, any other uh, questions? Someone's got a hand up back there. Ah, yes. I, um, I was curious to know if the intensity change can be only on volume based or you can uh, implement other parameters. Um, sure. Yeah, you could, you could do the intensity change on a volume basis. It's, it's only, just only another, it, it's, yeah, it's just, a, it's just an, another parameter, basically. No, he's asking if it can be other than volume. Yes. Oh, other than volume? Yeah, yes. so totally. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. In right. fact, that's the whole idea of being able to do it in games, is be able to say, like, if the player is healthy or not, then play some different kind of music, right. you know, that kind of thing. And again, you talk to your programmer and you, or your, your, your integrator and you get a, the hook. Here's a typical thing. Like, I think, what is it? Uh, Metal Gear Solid, right? You know, when you're playing Metal Gear Solid and you start getting more injured, what happens to the game audio? The game audio gets more reverbed and you get mm -hmm. more and more of your pain level coming up, right? So... There's some, a game engine that's already hooking up that says, okay, when your pain level is going up, I'm going to duck the volume of every single else thing that's going on inside the game in favor of the music and, you know, and, and whatever, like breathing, heavy breathing or something like that. And then when I come back to, to, to normalcy, I'm going to return that. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, let's, uh, let's go to my screen, <laughs> which I spent a lot of time making. <laughs> I actually happen to be a huge fan of the Sleepy Time Bear. I'll tell you guys about that in the break if you want to hear about it. Um, but uh, let's take a break for about five or ten minutes, and what we'll do is we'll reset, we'll come back, and now we're going to take the next part of the workflow, which is we're going to integrate it into uh, Game Engine. So we'll see these same sounds that you've, you've, you've taken to this, this stage, you'll see them inside of Unity 3D.